Okay, everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're happy to have you with us. It is on motivational interviewing. Um, this is going to be two parts. So we're going to be working from one slide deck here and covering pretty much what we can cover and hopefully ending at a spot where we can pick up easily next week. Um, so hopefully you will all be back with us next week as well. Um, if you weren't with us last week, uh, we discussed stages of change and stage-wise interventions, um, and that has been recorded and you can view that if you were not able to attend previously. So again, welcome um, motivation to motivational interviewing. I am joined by my colleague, Ken Kinter, from the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions here at Rutgers University. Uh, we are both faculty in the department and also both serve on an embedded, I'm not sure if you can call it embedded anymore because we're no longer um, uh, reside, not residing. We no longer have our office space primarily in our state psychiatric hospitals here in New Jersey, but we work on a uh, team of consultants that are dedicated to um, implementing, researching, and training around evidence-based practices in inpatient psychiatric settings. So it's a little bit about us. Today's webinar is hosted by DBHR through the Healthcare Authority. This is an interactive training and we encourage you to ask questions and interact throughout the session. The slides, as well as a link to the recording of the webinar will be available in the follow-up email after the presentation. And just to let everybody know, um, upon entry into the webinar, you are muted and your cameras are off. I did go ahead to make sure that in the chat, you are able to chat because that is another thing that Zoom is now doing is disabling chat for participants upon entry. So you all should be able to chat in the chat box. Um, also, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment through voice, which we love, um, please feel free to either raise your hand from the participant list, or you can simply type into the, the chat box that you have a question and you'd like the microphone and I'll happily unmute you. I will be uh, paying attention to the chat box um, in support of Ken today. He will be taking the lead. So feel free to send any of your messages through the chat or you can also privately send messages to Ken or myself. Next slide, please. Well, and with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Ken. I will be hanging out in the background. Thanks, guys. <laughs> also, there will be uh, pauses so that we can, uh, it, it's actually a clever ruse so that I can get a drink while this is going, but it also gives us time for uh, questions during the course of it. So we'll pause at least twice so that people can ask questions while they're going. Um, so as Dawn mentioned, first of all, hello, welcome. It's, uh, it's good to be working with everybody again. Uh, this is a two-parter on motivational interviewing, and we're really going to be touching base on the first half of these objectives here. We're going to talk about um, the spirit of motivational interviewing, the why of motivational interviewing, and specifically where motivational interviewing and stages of change come together. So if you caught last week, which I hope you did, um, we can start to glue these two things together. Uh, if you didn't, uh, you have the opportunity to catch the video. We also have a video on our Rutgers page, and I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you look up Ken Kinter, it comes up, and there's a, a short version of the videos there, so that should get you caught up pretty quick. So we're going to be focusing on the first half of these, right up through the interface between stages of change and motivational interviewing uh, today, and we'll see how far we get. And then we will get into the tools and all that good stuff uh, next time. Be a little more interactive next time, a little more didactic uh, today. So the reason that we talk about this is, and I'll, I'll, I'll joke about this a little bit, we were all trained pretty badly back in the day. Uh, I'm guessing those of you who are newer have more familiarity with stages of change and motivational interviewing. We were pretty much naively trained early on to just work with people that were ready to change. And as we know, most people aren't ready to change or they're not ready to change the things that we think they should change. So what ends up happening is we create resistance. You know, one of the central points of motivational interviewing as we'll get into is we very often put resistance on the client. So we'll say, you know, if two or three things don't work, we're gonna say, oh, you know what, this person's resistant to treatment. and Okay, part of that may be true, but part of it also may be we're out in front of the client. 
that we're further along in the change process for them than they are. And that is that creates a problem. So to a certain degree, how motivational interviewing would frame it is that clients are ambivalent. Part of them wants to change, part of them does not want to change. And um, in our case, our goal is to get in the same place in the change process as they are, to get in alignment with where and, their state of change is. Yep. And can I just, can I intervene for one moment here? Sure. I'm getting like hundreds of messages that the chat box isn't working. Um, can folks test that out? I see two. Oh, I just see mine. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to continue to try to work on that. So I just want folks to know that I did get your messages. So um, please refrain from sending any more only because I may have other uh, questions that get lost in it. I am working on resolving the problem. Thank you. And trust me, you want Dawn working on it rather than me. That would not go well if I did it. So thank you, Dawn. I appreciate uh, that. So that's pretty much the name of the game as far as alignment goes. Resistance is usually created when we are out in front of the client. The ambivalence that they already feel, whether that's fear of success, fear of failure, now catches up with us. And it's combined with us being biased. We want the person to change, the cheerleader for, for change, as it were, as we were talking about last week. So just to, uh, this is a, a graphic that I can't stand and we'll change it shortly, but it has some good points in it that I wanted to talk about. And that is that part of the purpose of assessing someone's stage of change is so that we can design interventions that are stage specific. So just in the way of a review from last time, so pre-contemplation or anti-contemplation as we were kidding about is that I don't have a problem or I have some other sort of cover story for the problem. I don't need to be in a psychiatric hospital. I'm really homeless and the police are picking on me, for example. So in pre-contemplation, there's a specific set of interventions that are targeted. That's when outreach happens. We go out to them because they're not coming to us. We hear their stories so that we can begin to develop a trusting relationship with them. We may offer other kinds of support to help that person that might help bring them to the table. And we're also assessing while they're telling us the cover story, we're listening to find out, okay, where are the weak points? Where are the places in this that we might be able to intervene? If someone says, usually I, I feel like Jesus Christ. However, I was on this one medication and I didn't feel like Jesus while I was on it. Okay, let's remember that. We're going to store that one for future use. In contemplation and preparation, as you remember, this is the scale. This is the, these are the reasons for change. These are the reasons to stay the same. And we want to educate, we want to put information on that scale as much as possible, and also try to find out what that person's motivations are. We're going to talk a lot more about that today. So for example, if someone was trying to quit smoking, I can sit here and say, well, cigarette smoking takes 14 years off your life, and it's very expensive, and it's bad for your children, and I can come up with a list 100 deep. The only one that matters is the one that matters to the client. So that's the one I'm running with. And that's what this part is, is assessing, what that person's motivations are. Even if they say, you know, I don't have any problem with smoking. I just hate the way I smell the next day. Okay, fine. Let's run with that. That's, that's what we're going to do. So moving down into action, this is where we put the change in, into movement. So skill building, supporting the person in change, and also cognitive behavioral aspect of change, the change talk in someone's head. What do they tell themselves? Are they afraid of success? Are they afraid of failure? Do they shame themselves because they haven't been successful before? Who are their supports? And then what are the stressors that are generated by the change? Even a positive change in your life generates stress somewhere, it generates some sort of anxiety. How do we deal with that? And then um, lastly, maintenance. How do we maintain the change? How do we grow that change into other part of a person's life? Does that person use that as an outreach to someone else to help others? Or do they just move it into other areas of their life? What's the next area of change? So that's the whole reason of, of diagnosing, for lack of a better word, what stage of change someone is in so that we can design an intervention that works for them. We Most of us are trained to here, sign the treatment plan and let's get right into action stage. And what we find is that 80 to 90% of people aren't there. So it's not helpful. 
one last thought about the stages of change. I don't know where I got this from. I, I should really give credit for this. I got this from one of my colleagues uh, and it's the learn. And, and I like to keep this in my, you know, in my head when I'm working with people. The L and learn is for listen. As there's an old uh, native uh, First Nations saying that is listen or your tongue will make you deaf. And it's listen, elicit discussion. Get the person to talk about their problem. What have they tried already? What are their motivations? Ask before giving advice. Reflect back what the person said to you. And we'll talk more about reflections uh, specifically next week. And the intervention, and here's where we violate learn a little bit, should match the stage they're in and start with the one they're furthest along in. So I like learn as an acronym for sort of a summary of these principles of matching interventions to where a person actually is. Ken, I have a couple of questions. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I acknowledged Sarah Lynn first, but I saw Lawrence had a question before her. Um, the question is, if someone is in maintenance, is there any reason clinically to work with them if they come to us saying that they have a craving? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maintenance there's a, well, I, I didn't even discuss this last week, and I, I have a moral and ethical dilemma on this one. So again, you guys are asking the great questions. In in the book in the book on stages of change, one of the hottest areas of controversy in it is they have a termination stage. So at some point, one of the big controversies on this is: Are you ever done? And we found that people who are years deep in a change, who may seem to be very solid in maintenance, still have the capacity for relapse. Uh, there's an old anecdote in the 12 step rooms that there are a lot of people who are sober for eight to 12 years and then they relapse. Now that's a long time. And the theory is that in those eight to 12 years, your life has changed quite a bit. You know, you're, you might not have charges on you anymore. Your legal situation may be all resolved. By now, you might be in the PTA or coaching soccer, and you know your life has changed significantly. So your the old stressors are gone, but there are new stressors that take their place, and this thing is still there. You know they've done data that show that cravings can endure for thirty years or more. So if that person is craving, yeah, we we go at them. Like, what is it? The um, the question, the way I've heard it phrased is. What's the next thing you have to work on? Or what else do you have to give up to move forward? You know, what's holding that person back at that time? So again, my, my strategies for maintenance for me would be, what's the next thing to work on? What's the next step forward for you in your recovery? And might that involve helping other people? You know, the keeping it green again from, you know, the AA philosophy. So yeah, I would take that very seriously because a person knows, you know, even if the pond is frozen, some of that nice might be pretty thin out there. So I, I would definitely um, move in that direction, take that seriously. I'm also guessing that as people that you work with in a community agency, there's probably a lot of pressure to discharge people and move them on because you've got the next emergency coming in the door. Um, but I would definitely take that serious. You hate to see someone who's got a really nice long recovery going on, something to be able to tip them over again. Okay, we have, thank you, Ken. There's a couple more questions. One from Sarah Lynn. Can somebody explain fear of success? And then it looks like I have one or two more questions. You just asked one of my favorite questions because <laughs> um, uh, it took me years to figure this one out for myself. So, okay, for me, working with people with addictions primarily, um, you can understand fear of failure, right? I hate the idea of trying something and I don't succeed and then I shame myself and that, you know, and that doesn't feel good. People who have negative core beliefs about themselves fear success more than they fear failure. They don't know what success is like. They know failure. Failure is like an old friend. Uh, the, the story was I was working with a gentleman recovering uh, from alcohol addiction, alcoholism, and he worked in construction. And he was famous for going out the night before he would start a new job and relapsing and then missing his first day of work. So he was deliberately sabotaging himself. And why he was sabotaging himself was he basically felt like he was a piece of crap. And acting in a manner inconsistent with being a piece of crap, he, he didn't know how to do that. 
the whole idea of paying his bills and getting rid of his fines and getting back on good terms with his uh, with the mother of his children and all that kind of stuff that's inconsistent with how he saw himself and a lot of people who have addictions in fact i would dare say nearly all have some pretty profound negative views about themselves so failure is an old friend success is this strange scary new place that they don't really know what to you know what to do with Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, one, I think one more question. What was the N in your listen acronym? Ac or, or learn, I'm sorry, <laughs> well, learn. The, the, the trick N is in the learn acronym. The trick is there isn't one. It's really intervention. <laughs> so we, we cheated Exceeded. a little on our acronym. So it's really leery, which it doesn't really work as <laughs> hey. well. That that kind of fits too, right? The leery. Um, the leery, the leery method of change. We're all a little leery about change. We're very leery about point, change, right? So that might actually work. All right, thank so it's you. Um, intervention. Okay. <laughs> um, and then our final question for now it comes from Shannon, and they ask: Is a close family member ever able to use these strategies? It seems only an outside entity would be successful. These are fantastic. If I made lists of questions and send these out in advance, this is these are the ones I would get. So I work with a lot of families in, in New Jersey. We have something called IFSS, Intensive Family Support Services. And it's completely comprised of the loved ones of people with mental illness and, and addictions. They are as interested in this topic as anyone because they are trying to get at, is my loved one really trying to change or are they just blowing a lot of the smoke at me? Um. So yes, somebody from the family can do it. It's hard because you know when you're you're close to your own family, it's a little tough. But I I encourage I, I promote the book to the families, the Changing for Good book, to families so that they can ask the right questions of themselves and of of their loved one about determining whether they're in change or not. Usually, what they're what they're sorting out is their loved one may be in pre contemplation. But telling them like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to fill out that job interview. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that without any real intention of doing any of that. So that's really the challenge. So they say, Wait a minute. They're telling me that they're in preparation. Everything that they're saying adds up to preparation or action, but it just doesn't happen. So this has been very helpful for families to determine, is someone really motivated to change or are they just stuck where they are? Working with families is a whole other fantastic topic. Um, I have a video called Helping Versus Enabling that goes into this in a lot of detail because uh, that's a that's a really tricky one. Okay, we have time for one more question at this point and then we need to move on and I'm probably right. going to pause the questions for at least 10 to 15 more minutes because we want to make sure that Ken can cover the material. You got so it. The final question for now is can you please, uh, it says, let's see, people who realize that they need to change and are aware of bad consequences but still choose to pursue whatever they are doing, how would you encourage them to change? And I think that that's the gist of this entire- That's exactly where we are. You are in the right place. You are in the right place. Um, yeah, we'll, we will get into that all as we, as we go forward. And if you're working with someone and you're trying to figure that out, I think that learn method is very helpful because that means we need to get more information from that person. So what we have right here, getting back to the, the the slide material, and I think we'll have time. We'll have time to get into more of this stuff, you know, later on as we go. What we have here in these little five questions is a quick and dirty, motivational, interviewing, friendly interview. Now, if we were all in person, I would have I would split you into two groups and have everybody ask each other all this stuff. But we got 317 people on this right now, so I am not going to manage that, and neither I'm not going to ask Dawn to do it either. So what I would what I would like you to think about is to if there were a if there was a homework assignment in this and you will be getting the slides and other accompanying materials i would ask you to try this out with someone the next time you're talking to someone about change whether it's in your professional life or your personal life i would just ask them these five questions and don't deviate from the script use this as a cue card if you have to why do you want to make this change so we're getting their motivation how might you go about it in order to succeed so we asked why, now we're asking how. What are the three best reasons to do it? How important is it for you to make this change? And we're gonna get into that importance piece in much greater detail next week. 
And so what do you think you'll do? So this is very motivational interviewing friendly because there's no advice. There's no judgment. All the content is coming from the client and all we're doing is listening, hopefully taking very careful notes because we're going to be using all of this. But at no point do we say, oh, have you tried this? Or maybe you should do this. Or, oh, I think that's great. You should really you know, think about doing this. Nope, all that's out. It's like we're completely out of it. We as helpers sometimes are best just as a sounding board because the person is trying to solve their own problem. And we interfere with that process by putting our own opinions and judgments in it. As well-intended and as well-educated as they are, we kind of break that flow up a little bit. So if there was a homework assignment on this, and I remember there was a homework assignment from last time I'll ask about uh, on one of the breaks as well, it would be ask these five questions and see what you learn and then ask the person what they're get, gonna get out of it um, as well. Because when you go this process, and I, and I would ask you to do this for yourself too, if you've got some downtime, ask yourself these five questions. Think about something that you wanna change about yourself and ask yourself these five questions. My guess is in the time it takes you to ask and answer these five questions, you will feel a shift in the thing you wanted to change because you've given it some time and you've given it some energy. So let's talk about some fundamental values of motivational interviewing. And I hope this comes as a relief to some of you, uh, especially those of you like me who labor under the delusion that I can say the perfect thing to make someone change or to make someone better. You don't have to make change happen. You can't. It's ultimately up to the person at the end of the day. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have them. As an added corollary to this one, if the person isn't ready to hear the answer in the moment, it doesn't matter if you give it to them. How many times has somebody said something to you and you just disregarded it or stored it in the moment, and then days, weeks, months, years later, you go, you know what? They were absolutely right. They were absolutely right. What they said didn't change. We were ready to hear it now. Something shifted. Um, I'm a big fan of reading the same book over and over and over again. Sometimes I'll be reading a book for the 20th time. I will swear there was something in that book that wasn't there before. So who broke into my house and replaced my book with an almost perfect copy, but with something else added into it? Nobody did that. There was just part of it that I was ready to hear. So the metaphor that motivational interviewing uses is the metaphor of dancing. Dancing is two people moving together. Wrestling is two people moving against each other. And our goal in being a change agent is to move with people. Now, I'm a terrible dancer, but I hear this is how this works. But I'm familiar with, as a helper, trying to come at that person and get them to change and get them to change and get them to change and becoming exhausted and still not moving that person any closer in the direction of change. Uh, I sat in on a group at the hospital, and this facilitator was really trying to talk this client out of using cocaine. This guy's goal was to get discharged from the hospital, get a job, get a place, and start using cocaine again. Now, even though every time once he adds cocaine to the equation, he bombs out of his house, bombs out of his job, gets arrested, and ends up back in the hospital again. She spent 45 minutes drilling this person to try to get them to, out of using cocaine, and with no success whatsoever. So at the end of the group, the facilitator is completely exhausted and the client is no closer in the direction of change. If anything, they sort of pull back, you know, into the trench a little bit. That's wrestling. So if you're exhausted at the end of a session with someone, that means you're working too hard. And it also means you're out in front of the client. So let's step it back and put the balance back on that client. Let's put the, let's put the work back on them, you know, to be able to come up with these answers instead of us trying to answer and do for them. So think of the dance as far as instead of uh, wrestling goes. So motivational interviewing, the book definition, which has to be included in here, it's a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment to change. Okay, that's great. Now let's talk about what that means in the real world. Collaboration, partnership, which we're going to talk about a lot. It's a conversation style. We're talking. That's all we're doing. It's not really directed. It's not, you know, it's in it's interaction. Strengthening a, a person's own motivation and commitment to change. What are their motivations to change? That's what we want to know. 
Uh, I don't know if any of you are boxing or MMA fans out there, but at the beginning of the match, you see the two combatants and they put all of their vital statistics up, you know, what their record is, what their height is, their weight is, their reach, all that kind of stuff. And to me, when you're, when you're working with someone regarding change, you want to know both sides. Here's the reason for change. Here's the reason for staying the same. And they're going to go up against each other soon. All right, this one person's a little heavier. This one person's got a longer reach. This person's a little younger. This person has a better record. And how's this going to go? And we want to strengthen the side that's on change, but we have to find out both those sides, the pros and the cons, before we get into that. And then ultimately their commitment to change. So we start in this information gathering mode, and then we end up by putting a, a, a plan together and going forward. So PACE is an acronym that's used in motivational interviewing quite a bit. Partnership, acceptance, uh, compassion, and evocation. In fact, let's talk about that just a little bit more. So partnership, preferably as close to an equal partnership as we can possibly have. Everybody knows there's a power differential. Everybody knows what their role is, but we try not to emphasize that any more than necessary and have the person have as mac the maximum power over their own life. Acceptance. I'm still here. Even if you don't follow what we're supposed to do, even if you end up going into relapse or recycle and you go back again to a lower stage, I'm still here for you. I accept you for who you are instead of what I want you to be. And that's a big difference. That's that con that's unconditional versus that conditional positive regard. You know, I love you if, I love you when, as opposed to, look, I just love you and I accept you for, for what you are. Compassion. We're all in the same boat. There's lots of things we're all trying to change. None of us are perfect. There are things that we're better at than others. We know suffering. They know suffering. And actually, our knowledge of our own suffering is one of the best tools in understanding the suffering of someone else. It doesn't mean it's the same thing, but it puts you in the general neighborhood, you know, and you know how it felt for you. And evocation, just getting the person to talk. Uh, despite how I'm doing right now, usually you gauge the success of an MI session. If there was a little needle in the middle and over here when the facilitator talks and over here when the client speaks, you always want it a little closer over to the client side. You know, we're trying to get them to talk and help them problem solve because that's what they're doing. Can I take have... over their change process. Sorry, I have hmm. one. I have a question that seems a lot of people agree is a pretty good question for Ooh. Monica. And it is that if you've been wrestling with a client and now through this incredible training learned, you've been coming at it all the wrong way. Is it appropriate to apologize to them for making them feel as though they needed to defend themselves or is changing your methods sufficient without addressing it? It takes a lot to apologize and, and people don't do it very often. And when we do apologize, we tend to make it conditional. I'm sorry you felt that way. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. I like, I like the apology. I like the apology. I, and I, I like the idea of taking responsibility. Because, um, again, the alternative is you don't want the client to take it on. You don't want them to feel shame that they did something wrong. So I don't think there's anything wrong with, with saying, you know, I, I could have done better on this. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't do better on this. Or, you know, I... I Thich Nhat Hanh, who I'm a huge fan with, you know, if you see over my over my shoulder, I've got a couple quotes up there. He was very quick to say, you know, I, I apologize for not being skillful enough in that situation. And I, I always like that. You know, I like the idea of, you know, I'm Kinda trying like, to get that. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm I came at it the wrong way, even mm -hmm. it could be pretty simple, right? Sure. Sure. And I, I also think it emphasizes the idea that you and the client are going on a journey together. And both of you are going to do things, you know, both of you are going to make mistakes and, and you're both going to learn along the way. And of course, how we learn is by making mistakes. So I, I love the idea of saying, you know what, I'm sorry, I, I could have, I could have done better. I could have done better and I'm going to do better. And I think it just kind of, I, I think that's a really nice emotional tone to set with a client instead of, okay, we can't make any mistakes. If we course correct, let's just pretend that other thing didn't happen. No, we're not perfect. And it's also fine to say, look, Everything doesn't work with everybody. Something I did that worked magnificently with another person, it just didn't work here. And that's okay. You know, let's try something else that's going to work now. 
you know, we certainly have the example of everybody taking medication and everybody going in different directions with medication, right? Doesn't mean that the medication is bad, just didn't work here, didn't work here with that person. Another great question. So moving on into the method as far as motivational interviewing as a process, and we'll look at the tools and how all these work out, uh, you know, as we go. So this one, this, this process talks about motivational interviewing is very much about creating the working alliance. And I'm very sure philosophically, a lot of you come from that same sort of place. The relationship is the kind of the, the, the crucible or the container in which all change happens. Unfortunately, and I'm sure many of you are guilty of this, I was certainly guilty of this working in the emergency room where it's like, chop, 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 let's get to it. Um, we short sell the engagement part. You know, hi, I'm Ken, I'm going to be working with you. Let's get down to business. Uh, you know, in an emergency room, the primary goal people want is to get out of the emergency room. So that's kind of good. The downside is we don't spend enough time in the, look, I'm here to help you out. I'm here to listen and I'm here to help. And, you know, I want things to get better so that that person can establish some sort of trust. You may also be in that position. If your service has a lot of time limits on it, you may be under a lot of time pressure. And this is where we suffer. We suffer in that we don't build the relationship. And unfortunately, the mental health system can be like a lot of cogs in the wheel where, okay, you're my 27th social worker, or you're my 14th case manager, you know, and, and after a while, it's just, you know, we're the, we're the assembly line. So that engagement piece is the starting point, and it's really critical. After that part happens, after that engagement happens, and we do most of that by listening, then it's focusing, then it's the why are you here? You know, what are you here for? Because my perception of why that person's here and their perception of why that person's here might be really far apart. And we need to some sort of agreement. If we can't come to agreement on defining the situation that we're going to change, we're going to have problems putting together a plan to, to, uh, to alleviate it. And a really good point in here is what they call goal versus deficit. And this is a reframe. Instead of saying, what's wrong with you? You know, here's what we're here to fix. It's what are we here to accomplish? What is it you want? You know, again, this is very psych rehab, you know, recovery friendly. What is your goal? You know, and it, even to take something as simple as uh, readmissions where you say, okay, well, I noticed you've been in the hospital every year for the last five years. So instead of saying, well, we want to stop you from going back in the hospital or your goal is a year outside of the hospital. You know, just being able to spin it into a positive. So hopefully it's more inspiring and motivating than avoiding failure. And again, that goes back into that success failure thing we were talking before. So we've engaged and created the therapeutic relationship. Now we start to focus and drill down on the problem. And now we get the story. And as we're getting the story, this is where we're getting what stage of change they're in for all the different things they have going on. Most of our clients have multiple dimensions of things going on. Um, they have psychiatric problems. They may have addiction issues. They may have medical issues, legal issues, housing issues, all this kind of stuff. So now we're getting the story. Here's everything that they're working on. Here's how they see it. Here's what they're primarily motivated to change or to work on. So now we map out our stages of change. This is where we do the diagnosis of change which I actually put more priority on than diagnosing an illness or an addiction. Then after we get that whole story, then we move into planning. What are we taking on first? Uh, those of you who were with us last week, uh, you remember those little vignettes and the vignette had three or four stages to it. So we had somebody who'd been on medication for a while. Uh, they were drinking and they were also smoking pot, but they had a completely different profile in where they were with each of those things one of which may have been action or maintenance, one of which may have been contemplation and one was pre-contemplation. And so we were, we made our plan based on what that person was furthest along in and ready to move on and, and build on the success. So now we move into the tools a little bit. And the primary tool in motivational interviewing is ORS. And it stands for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And we'll go through each of these. How are we doing on? Just going to do a time check here. Actually, let's let's any any questions at this point. Just take a breath and uh, 
see if there are any questions. There are, I'm there is one question that I have, um, uh, two questions. All right, so I will start with the first that I received from Shannon. How do you handle lies? I deal with this both with a uh, sister with an addiction and with clients. I have said, I'm not judging, just please don't lie. Even a non-answer is better than lies for me. That was the mm -hmm. first question. Oh, you're gonna enjoy reflections. So even using the word lie, is you know has a little bit of a spine on it right because you're you're basically putting that out there even if it is quite quite obviously a lie and when we get to reflections there's going to be something called a double-sided reflection and i want you to pay really close attention to that because that's that's the answer to your uh to your question the other part of it that i would say and it's funny my 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 wife is also a therapist she likes working with children and adolescents and couples, and I like working with people with severe mental illness um, and addictions. She's not so thrilled working with people with addictions. And the reason she gives is a very good reason. She says, I don't like it. I don't like working with people with addictions because they lie to me. And I said, they're not lying to you. They're lying to themselves. You're just in the room when it happens. So, and I know if this is happening with a family member, this is very, very close to home. But one of the first things is don't personalize it. It has nothing to do with you. If it was anybody else asking the same question, they would tell the same lie because that's what they're telling themselves. You know, ultimately, the addict, and I know that's a loaded word for a lot of people, it's used in fellowship still, is lying to themselves primarily. And until they stop lying to themselves, they're not going to stop lying to you or to anybody else. So I know that's a big deal when it's a family member. How do you kind of take that breath and step back and say, look, they're not lying to me. They're lying to themselves. But I would make that a mantra for yourself. The double-sided reflection, just to give a little, little touch of that before we get into it, is the idea that – all right, I'll give you, I'll give you a great example. My, my colleague worked with people that had lost their license. And so they had to do the requisite mandated sessions before they were able to get their license back. So you can imagine what stage of change a lot of these people are in. They don't want to change anything. They just want to get their license back. So they want to do their sessions. And I used to hear the greatest stories of how people weren't actually addicted to alcohol, even though some of them were on their seventh DWI. I didn't know you could get a seventh DWI, but apparently you can. So this guy says, well, you know, I, you know, I didn't really drive drunk. I, I just drove down the street because my friend who was supposed to be sober was trying. And there's this long story, right? And so my, my, my colleague said back to them, I hear you telling me that you're not an alcoholic. I also heard you tell me that you have seven DWIs. Could you explain that to me? So I kind of like that. That's like, a you know, you're presenting them with both sides and, and ultimately you're inviting them to trip over their own story to a certain degree. Thanks, Ken. We have one more question for now. Um, and that comes from Vincent and they ask, can you say more about the why stage of change? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can you say more about why the stage of change is more important than, a di than the diagnosis? Oh, okay. Loaded question. And another great question. Um, Okay, maybe you guys, maybe you guys can help me with this one. I've become really disenchanted with diagnosis over 33 years of being in the field. When I started out, I was Mr. DSM. I would have the book. I would have the decision trees. I made up a list of questions based on the decision trees. I did all that stuff because I wanted to get the diagnosis exactly perfect. Somewhere down the line, I stopped caring so much about that. I stopped caring so much about getting that right. And the purpose of the diagnosis for me was twofold. One, to just indicate the proper course of treatment. Like once you had an idea of what the course of treatment was, you moved on. The other one was for reimbursement, just to be perfectly blunt and honest about that. That's, that's in the DSM video. So I, I started caring less about, and, and the other thing I found was that a lot, of, a lot of clients got really wrapped up in diagnosis, like overly so. Where wait a minute, am I am I schizoaffective or am I really bipolar uh, one with psychotic features? And I was like, get out of the woods, get out of the woods. Let's let's work on something that's really practical. 
Uh, diagnosis, as necessary as it is, comes with some peril. Uh, for example, the stigma that comes along with certain diagnoses. You see the look on some parents' faces. We've had to tell you know, parents, hey, you know, we think your child has had a psychotic episode. And they will look at us like, is it schizophrenia? And they look at us as if we're diagnosing a, a terminal disease. You know, it's like if you were telling somebody they had cancer or something else, God forbid. And whether we said it was schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder or whatever we said it was, the diagnos diagnosis is not severity, but it's frequently mistaken for it. So that, that becomes a big challenge. So I'm not a, as much a fan of it as, as I used to be. And of course, then the diagnoses change and certain diagnoses get wiped out and merged in with other ones and all that kind of stuff. I encourage clients to educate themselves about different diagnoses and see which one they feel fits them and what part of it fits them and what part of it doesn't. I think that part makes a really nice discussion, um, but I'm not as into it as I used to be. What I do want to know is what is that person ready to change and why? You know, what is their reason? Um, did cigarettes get really expensive for them all of a sudden? Are they planning on having a baby and they don't want the baby impacted by the cigarette smoke? Did they just see a new study? Did someone close to them die of a cigarette related illness? That's what I want to know. Because I want to go right into alleviating suffering. And there's a part where cataloging it doesn't really help so much anymore. I hope I answered that one well. That was long winded. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Any other questions about that? And then we'll move on. Sorry, I was responding to questions <laughs> and answers. Um, this is really hard with over 300 people. I know. Um, I know. Just one comment that I, I did want to add to that, to your reasoning for why you're not a huge fan of diagnoses. I did want to acknowledge that one person had stated that it can be devastating to show up for a specialty appointment and a chronically ill person not come away with a diagnosis, like a confirmation that, hey, something is going on, right? That oh. that can be treated or helped or recovered from. So I did want to make that point that it can be very person specific in terms of whether or not the diagnosis can be of benefit to the person, per, you know, personally in their recovery. A hundred percent. And and I'm going to own a bias in this area. Um, because I, as we talked about a little bit before we didn't do the, the biography so much, but the first half of my career was working in emergency services where we did emergency psychiatric evaluations. And very often we were the first people to diagnose someone that scenario I described for you before, where someone might be away at college and have their first psychotic episode is something that happened every semester. We had to deal with that all the time. And you know, very often we were the first clinician to really sit down with somebody, particularly if they had refused, you know, if they were in the real early prodromal stages of an illness and they were like, I don't need help. I don't need to see anybody. It finally crossed the threshold into emergency and came to us. So I am very conscious of the flip side of that, which is the impact. When you say, you know what, look, this, this, this really does look like, you know, I'm not going to say I sit with you one time and I can make a definitive diagnosis. And in our position, every diagnosis we gave was provisional anyway, but we could say, boy, this looks a lot like bipolar disorder, or this really seems it's a lot like schizophrenia or something along those lines. The impact of that on a person or on a family, and I, I hear your point, your point is, is completely accurate, that sometimes it's validating. You know, we don't go to medical doctors say, geez, I really hope they find something wrong with me. But if we go with a set of symptoms, it's to some degree, it's reassuring when they say, oh, it's this. Oh, great. Okay. What do we need to do? In the psychiatric side, I'm very mindful of the stigma that comes along with it. You put that on somebody and the, the very often diagnosis and prognosis is conflated. So they hear a diagnosis and they automatically start to project how they're going to do or how their loved one's going to do going forward. And that we don't want. We don't want that. Um, you know, we want a okay, diagnosis is necessary. It helps point people. It, it does help validate, hey, there is something going on with me that isn't just me. 
and it, it's there, it's true. And now I can move in the direction of treating this and hopefully, you know, being able to manage it and function better with it. So that's a good point. All right, so actually we're gonna be able to go into the tools because we're not doing all the interaction we normally do. So this is moving along pretty quick. So the four core skills of motivational interviewing are ORs, we mentioned before. And we're gonna go through all three of them and or all four of them, and we'll actually have some time to go into them in, in detail. So I don't know if you've even thought about it, but in your job, you do assessments and interviews and all that kind of stuff. And very often, a lot of these things are comprised of closed-ended questions. So closed-ended questions that just ask yes or no, or just a specific type of fact. And those aren't conversational, and those aren't MI friendly, and they don't build a relationship. So uh, think about your own intake forms, or your own assessment forms. Do you ask a lot of yes or no questions? My my experience with this was working in the emergency room. We we had this uh, substance abuse evaluation that I hated, and it was all yes or no questions. Are you currently using alcohol? Yes, no. Have you used it in the past? Yes, no. Have you ever been in treatment for alcohol? Yes, no. So it's like six yes, no questions for alcohol. Then we do amphetamines, then barbiturates, then benzodiazepines, then cannabinoids. Yes, we do all of those yes or no questions, or did anyway, for each drug of choice. So I'm subjecting someone to this in an interview. I get all the way to the end and I'm ready to move on. And the person says, I used to sniff gas. I went, what? And he says, well, I used to sniff gasoline, but that wasn't on your questionnaire. And it was then that I realized that my questionnaire sucked and, um, and that I needed to do something about it because it was really not helpful. So at that point, I converted our substance abuse interview into something that was more open-ended. I said, tell me about your history of substance use. And then I would use the specific closed-ended questions to fill those potholes along the way. So the whole goal of an open-ended question was to, to sponsor conversation. Because if this person had drank heavily 20 years ago, but haven't had anything in the last 20 years, that's something I need to know. So we build the relationship as the conversation goes. An open-ended question would have allowed room for that person to share about their history of huffing gas or you know, whatever else they were, were using. So let's test this out. Open or closed-ended questions. What would you like from treatment? Is that an open or closed-ended question? And by defining it as a closed-ended question means you can answer it with yes or no or a specific piece of data. Please throw in the chat and you can cheat if you want. You can do O or C. That's probably a lot easier uh, than typing open or closed. I'm a terrible typist. So what would you like from treatment? Is that open or closed? Everyone is saying open. Ah, that's an easy one. Okay, all right, all right. Got to work harder to fool this crowd. Was your family religious? Is that open or closed? I think these are too easy. Too easy. <laughs> uh, close, closed, closed. All right, yeah, I thought we'd catch them because it's the morning still, right? I didn't think they'd be properly caffeinated, but they're all over it. All right, what do you like about drinking? Open or closed? This like is a good, yeah, lots of open. Good, that's correct. Uh, and th this is a question I love to ask, by the way. Very motivational interviewing friendly question. What are the good sides of it? Instead of just assuming that everything's negative. If you were to quit, how would you do it? Is that open or closed? The opens are pouring in. <sighs> All right. All right. Now the gloves are coming off. Is this an open-ended question? <laughs> they picked up on it. it's closed damn it well and also the reason this is a trick question is it's closed but if they say no that still counts that's still good i didn't get a chance to look in the chat because there's way too much of it i'm scared of it at this point so if you said it closed that's still good too so just seeing if you're awake out there although they're in the land of starbucks so everybody's awake right everybody's properly caffeinated Okay, so that's open-ended, uh, uh, the open-ended questions. Now let's move on to affirmations. And affirmations, I made a big mistake about affirmations for a long time. I used to think it was just praise, just open-ended praise for a person. And I got sort of hip to, from someone else, one of my colleagues, that that was not the case. So 
affirmations is praise, but it's about the target behavior that you're working on. So it's targeted to help move that person in the direction of change, not just necessarily that you look nice today. So it should focus on a strength. It, it's, it's noticing positive momentum in the target behavior. It's got to be genuine. So I don't know if we have any sarcastic people in the house today. Dawn and I are extremely sarcastic. I think that comes along with New Jersey, uh, but I, I, it's not unique to New Jersey, I'm sure. So you guys are all familiar with the backhanded compliment, right? Where it's, well, okay, you're not as ugly as you were yesterday or you know, something along those lines. Uh, it's got to be genuine. It can't be, the person can't read from that, that they've been sniped in some way because that doesn't feel too good and we're on the receiving end of it. It expresses positive regard and caring, strengthens the therapeutic relationship. In the early part of a relationship, the, um, I would say affirmations are probably the cheapest and easiest way to develop a relationship. Just acknowledging, just the idea that a person wants to make a positive change in their life is noteworthy, is, is worthy of affirming. And one of the places that we jam up in the hospital is that even when someone's still in, engaging in the negative target behavior, even if they make progress on it. So in, in the hospital, there's a classic example of someone who shows up 10 minutes late for group every day. 10 minutes late, 10 minutes late, 10 minutes late. Well, one time they come to group and they're five minutes late. Is that positive momentum? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's noteworthy. That's noteworthy of praise. It's progress, you know, and that's what we're looking for, not necessarily perfection. But again, it can't be backhanded. If I say, oh, you were only five minutes late today. Ah, ah, ah. No, that doesn't, that doesn't work. As tempting as it is from my side. So examples of uh, affirmations include comment, take positively on an attribute. Again, strong person, real survivor. Uh, a statement of appreciation. Catching the person doing something right, I think, is, is probably the core of it. Noticing. I, um, I, I've always noticed that if someone compliments, I have this joke with my wife because if she wears something to work and someone compliments it, I know it's going to be going back to work again real soon because it got praise. So here's the funny part of this. If someone that she doesn't really know compliments her, that has more weight than when I do it. If I compliment her and tell her he, she looks nice, that carries less weight than somebody who's like a total stranger. And I don't know why that is. She told me once, well, you have to say I look nice. So I don't know if that's what undermines it. I'm not really sure. But either way, um, an expression of hope, caring, and support. So it's something positive, just bringing a little positivity to the relationship. But the better you can target that, you know, the better you can acknowledge progress and see it in that person, you can really help move that person along in the direction uh, of change. All right. So any questions before we go into reflections? Because reflections is the hardest part of this. I don't even know if we're going to have time to, to get through all of it, but we're at least going to start the journey on it today. So any questions on anything we've covered so far before we get into this? I don't see anything in the chat. All right. So what we have here in this very strange little slide, we on the left-hand side, we have a speaker. And on the right-hand side, we have a listener. So the speaker has something that they want to say. So you see where meaning turns into words. So they, they have an intention. There's something that they want to communicate. They put that thought into words, and then it moves over to the listener. And then the listener has their, their meaning of it as well. And you also see these three red numbers, one, two, and three. So these three numbers is where communication breaks down. So the red number one is, have you ever had this feeling, this happens to me every day, where you know what you want to say, and then you open your mouth and something falls out, and it's not what you wanted to say at all. It just, what you said totally didn't capture the meaning of what you wanted to communicate. Again, this happens to me on a daily basis. So that's communication fail number one. You almost want to go, okay, stop, take two, can we do a do-over, please, and start that one from the beginning. Number two is when the words aren't heard accurately by the listener. So there was this, uh, this exercise we used to do, I think they call it the telephone exercise, where you get to whisper something to one person, you only get to whisper it to them once, and then they whisper it to the next person, the next person, the next person, the next person. By the time it gets all the way to the other side of the room, it's been completely mutilated because it's just a combination of all what people didn't hear properly. 
So that's a whole bunch of number two errors piled on top of each other. So again, the meaning gets lost. The third part of communication failing is when the words mean something different to the listener than they do to the speaker. Now, I'll give you an example of that. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Jalen Rose is. Uh, he was a, a, a famous uh, college and basketball player, and he's a commentator now, I think, on ESPN. He tells a story about he and he and a friend were driving around in Los Angeles, and they made a, a wrong turn, and they turned into a kind of rough neighborhood. And so he's at a convertible with his friend, and he stops at a light. Car pulls up next to him, and somebody in the other car pulls out a gun and points it at him. He hits the gas and takes off, and he hears shots fired as he's pulling away. And he looks, and his friend's been shot. So he's trying to drive away from the scene. He grabs his phone. He calls 911, and he says, somebody shot my dog. Somebody shot my dog. Somebody shot my dog. So the 911 operator gave him directions to the nearest veterinary hospital. So you can see where they, now the good news is the veterinary hospital was right next to the people hospital. So the directions were still uh, valid and his friend got through it, but still still is carrying a, a bullet or two from that incident. But to me, you can see the difference in meaning between those two people. Now he's, he's upset and he's, you know, he's, he's very upset about his friend getting shot. He's obviously concerned about his own safety. The 911 operator hears dog and immediately thinks this is a veterinary issue. So that happens all the time because me, diff, mean, words mean different things to different people. The meaning of words also changes over time. In fact, I'll ask you guys for an example of that. I, I can throw a few of them at you. The, the word lit means something different than it used to mean, or it's picked up a meaning along the way. Uh, I'm now hearing about things being fire that actually aren't on fire. So that apparently means something else along the way. Uh, and the word bad, not only has it changed meaning over time, but it's become its own opposite and then back again. So at this point, I'm not really sure if bad is bad or if bad is good. It's kind of somewhere in between, or it might be both to different people. Could somebody throw in the chat uh, an example of that? What's a word that, you know, you use it one way, somebody else uses it some other way, but the meaning gets lost, even though the word's been said properly. Yeah, folks are saying like bad, sick, dope, filthy. <laughs> Yes. Jacked, tight, sweet, fish, bed. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot, lot of words. Yes, I look stuff up in Urban Dictionary about once a month now because yeah, I mean, I'm you know, I'm just not, you know, I'm not, I'm not hip to the lingo if that means anything to anybody. I'm not sure. But it, and you got to stay on top of that because sometimes what means to what means something to one person means something completely different to to someone else. And it's not just limited to uh, words. It's also, it's also extended to nonverbal communication. Um, when I first got to the state hospital where I work now, and that was 16 years ago, Dawn, if you can believe that, and just celebrated my 16th anniversary at that hospital. Um, one thing I saw happen one of my first days was a young African-American man walked up to another young African-American man, put his fist up and said, what up, dog? And I watched this. Now, again, give me a break here. It was 2006. <laughs> and uh, I thought that he was goading him into a fight. What was really happening? What was really happening was welcome. It was hello. You know, it was a friendly greeting and the other person reciprocated. Since then, now the fist bump is everywhere and all that kind of stuff. But I missed it. So between ages and cultures and time, all of these things change. But the, the critical piece of that is the meaning gets lost along the way. So how do we solve these problems? Because again, if any one of these things happen, the meaning gets lost. And reflection, which to me is one of the real, it's probably, I would say it's probably the most critical skill to learn in motivational interviewing Um is this is what solves that problem. It closes, it turns that you into sort of a circle. And all a reflection really is, is just saying back to the person some version of what they said to you. So again, you get to bounce it back because if, if you've captured it accurately, then we have understanding. If you say something back to that person, they have no idea what you're talking about, then obviously the communication wasn't effective. So 
unlike what we've been talking about, reflections are statements. And they can be a very simple and short statement, or they can be much more elaborate as we'll get into the different types in a little bit. Reflections really have two functions. One is letting the person know that you not only heard them, but you understood them and you've demonstrated that you've understood them. You also have the possibility of throwing a hypothesis in there. You have the chance of throwing a guess in there as to that person's meaning or a deeper level of meaning. So in that way, a reflection can kind of take the place of a question. I find reflections actually more helpful than questions because a question redirects. A reflection keeps the person going in the direction they were already going. So you're, you're kind of going deeper with it. And we'll get into more detail about that. So one of the ways, there's a couple things that separate reflections from questions. So a question very often starts off with question words. So the who, what, where, when, why, how, usually those words precede a, a question. The other thing that tends to typify a question is your voice inflection goes up at the end. So when somebody says, well, how long have you been drinking? Or when was the last time you quit? Or when was the last time you were actually taking medication? You hear that little inflection up at the end? Now, I don't want to go too far out on a limb here, but there are a lot of people out there, and you might, I don't know if you're one of them. Dawn and I have a colleague who's one of them where every sentence ends up in an uplift. So every sentence kind of ends on an up pitch, and I don't find that particularly helpful, but that's kind of how that works. So in order to convert a question into a reflection, we need to get rid of those question words. So instead, so instead of starting with how, who, you know, who, what, where, when, why, how, and this do you mean, we just make a statement. A reflection is said to the person as if it were true, because you will see in their face in a fraction of a second whether it's actually true or not. And there's no, there's no consequence for being wrong. The person wants you to get it. Um, Bill Miller has this great saying, he's one of the, you know, one of the founders of motivational interviewing. People don't want to be fixed. They want to be heard. And if you take one thing away from today, I would really like that to be it. They don't want to be fixed. They want to be heard. And think about that from your own experience when you have an interaction with somebody. You might not interact with someone with the intention of, all right, I want them to change me. I want them to add something new. I want something different. If you walk away with, they heard me, that's a win. And in addition to that being a win just in that moment, it's a win in the direction of, of change. So just to, as, a, as a starter, so there are, um, these are some examples of some reflection starters for simple reflections. So the most basic one in the world is sounds like. And a couple other ones, what I heard you say is, let me get this straight, if I heard you correctly, you sound or what you mean is. Now, these are just generic examples. These might not work coming out of your mouth. They may not work hearing, you know, to the clients that you serve. They may be different. You're going to find your own way of this, you know, your own way to work this. Um, where I work, I hear different versions that don't work coming out of my mouth, but they work in that particular setting. But what this does is these little starters get you out of the habit of asking a question. So that's the real point of that. So you lead with those first couple words and then go from there. And eventually you'll find your own. So two types of simple reflections. And again, the goal of a simple reflection is just to let a person know that you heard what they said. So the first one is repetition, which is just parroting back what they say to you. Now, this sounds dopey, right? If you were working with someone and you just echoed back everything they said to you at a certain point, they would either walk out of the room or become aggressive to you or whatever. Um, but we can't undersell how critical this skill is just to be able to say back what was said to you. So um, my, my wife and I work with a lot of couples, couples, especially couples that have been together a long time, stop listening to each other. They just don't, they just don't hear the words and they're so used to editing what the other person says that they don't even realize they're doing it anymore. So my wife and I are working with this one couple and 
we were trying to get them in the habit of just repeating back what the person had said to them. So here's the example. So the wife says to the husband, and again, these people have been together like 20 years. I wish you would help me more around the house. So then we asked the husband, what did your wife just say to you? She said, I don't help her around the house. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> so we had it three times. Three times the woman had to say, I wish you would help me more around the house. Finally, after three, maybe four times, he said, well, she's, she's just asking, you know, she's just saying she wishes I would help her more around the house. Yay, we win. And then we reverse it. But you see what happened? He changed, he maybe unintentionally, maybe intentionally changed the meaning of what was said. And that kind of fit his purpose. So just being able to say it back, you will make a very nice career for yourself as a marriage therapist if you just get in the habit of having couples talk to each other until they get to the point where they can repeat it back. So repetition is you give it back exactly as you got it. Rephrase is a little different. Rephrasing is you're saying it back, but in your own words. So you have a little, you have a chance to interpret it a little bit and add something to it. Because again, all you're doing is giving it back. Now let's get into complex reflections. And that one question about your family lying to you is, is, is coming up about now. So complex reflections are where you start to add that hypothesis. And now you can guide the conversation a little bit by choosing what part of what a person says that you focus on. So for this one, we'll, we'll just do a scenario here. Uh, in the, the state hospital where Dawn and I work, there are a lot of people that are on the verge of retirement. In fact, I think through COVID, most of them have actually retired now. <laughs> I don't know if that's happened out by you guys. So let's take a scenario where if I'm, if I'm the client and I'll role play. So something that I'm, I'm thinking about changing is, you know what, I'm just about ready to retire and I'm so psyched about it, but... I'm, I'm also a little nervous because I've had my time dictated for me for so long and I've had this routine down forever. I know what time I'm going to work. I know what time I'm going to lunch. I know what time I'm getting home. My life has been set like this for a very long time. And I admit to being a little nervous about not having that. And you know, what's my life gonna look like next? So with that being the vignette, the scenario, We'll talk about the different types of reflections, and we'll demonstrate this a little more uh, when we get into next, uh, next time. So reflecting content would be you're planning your retirement. It's just the content, no emotion whatsoever, just the facts. Reflecting feeling is where you just catch, you choose to focus on the emotion of the moment. You're excited. I hear that you're excited about retiring. Reflecting meaning catches both of these. So you catch some content and some feeling. This was actually the reflection I gave when the scenario came up in real life. I just said, freedom, because at one point, freedom is very exciting and very joyous, but at the same time, it's also a little scary, right? Now, double-sided reflection. We talked about this a little bit before. So I hear that you're excited about retiring, but you're also a little nervous because you're not sure what you want to do with your free time. Did you hear how the double-sided reflection catches both sides? So to that person who was talking about their family member and their clients lying to them, you present both sides of the argument to the jury evenly, right? So the example I gave before, so I hear you telling me that you're not an alcoholic, but I've also heard you tell me that you have seven DWIs. That's a double-sided reflection. And you just hand that to the person to see how they justify those things. You don't weigh in. So I, I find double-sided reflections really, really, really powerful because you're not picking a side. You're coming at it from both sides. So other common examples might be, so I hear that you don't have a mental illness and you don't need medication, but I also hear that you've been hospitalized six times in the last three years. I didn't weigh in. I'm leaving it to them to rectify it. Very often I'd follow with a question. Can you tell me more about that? Or, you know, how do you, how do you see those two things sitting together? Any questions or any scenarios about that? Cause that's, this is a pretty critical one. This to me is a very helpful tool uh, for you all. So 
So I don't know, Donna, are you, are you seeing any? I'm not seeing any questions. I'll, I'll let you know we have about 20 minutes. Okay. All right. So we'll, yeah, we'll get through probably, we'll get through the ORs and then that, that'll probably be where we get today. So, but I want you to think about that one. And again, we can talk about that more, especially as we get into next week. Next week is going to be more, more practice and all that kind of stuff. So we'll get a chance to put this in action. But if you have somebody who's telling you one thing and reality is telling you something else, pointing out that discrepancy and just putting that out there in front of them is a really, really powerful tool. If you just say, look, you're an alcoholic, the obvious answer is no, I'm not, even if it's a God's honest truth. So this is a little more of a finesse way to go about it. The next one is the amplified reflection. Now, any of you who have teenagers, I'm sure there's some of you out there that have teenagers or even tweens, uh, amplified reflection is probably something you've done without even realizing it. Uh, you may have done it with your clients without realizing it too. And it's taking what a person says and just going to the ridiculous degree with it, just taking it to its furthest ridiculous level. So it, in this one, if the amplified reflection be being retired is going to be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. And you're going too far with it for a reason. You're looking to see if that person's going to bring you back or not. So another example that I like is there's a, uh, there's a gentleman in our hospital who's extremely destructive. He's ripped a, he ripped a pay phone off the wall. He's thrown chairs through windows. He's assaulted countless staff. Not a big guy, but really, really, really destructive. And I was coming on his unit one day and he was running down the hallway at me. And I'm thinking, okay, this is going to go very badly. And he was so angry and he's running up to me. He goes, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken. He says, this is the most pissed off I've ever, I'm so pissed off. The nurse ignored me. I'm so pissed off. I'm going to throw a chair. And I'm thinking, okay, well, he's not going to assault me. So that's, you know, that's where we start, right? We're good there. He at least had enough presence of mind to, you know, to do this. And so I just had enough cognition about me to say, this is the most angry you've ever been in your life. And it stopped him for a second. He had to stop and he had to think about it. He goes, nah, I've been a lot more pissed off than this. Okay, good. That's the intention. That's the idea of amplifying it. You, you take what they said and you actually distort it a little more in the direction that they're going in so that they can catch it. Um, my other favorite example of this, and, and <laughs> I don't know if this is good or bad parenting or not, but my, my best friend has a little girl, she's about 11, 12 years old, and she's very dramatic. And whenever daddy and I are going to go out somewhere and she can't go, she throws herself on the floor like she's dead. So she just kind of flops on the floor and daddy comes over and picks her up and hugs her and all this kind of stuff. And it's very sweet, but it also, it's the reward for the behavior that she's looking for. So you can't do stuff like that in front of a therapist because therapy is actually going to happen or some sort of intervention is going to happen. So she flops on the floor. I come over with a blanket. I put the blanket over her and I start holding her funeral. So here lies Abby. Abby was a sweet little girl, died way too soon. And of course, she gets up and throws the blanket off. She says, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. So again, I'm going in the direction that she's going. I'm just going into it to a ridiculous uh, level. Now, again, you got to know somebody to do these paradoxical interventions, but they can be very, they can be very helpful. It lets them see what they're doing. Uh, and the I have one question, <clears throat> I think, um, from Ruslan. And it is, where do you go from a double-sided reflection? You've repeated what they have said. But if the client is waiting for input from you, it might make them feel as if the therapist has nothing to offer if all I hear is my thoughts coming back to me. And they said, hope that makes sense. Just trying to play devil's advocate. No, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. You have, you have two options. One is to just leave it there. It's, it's the therapeutic use of discomfort. So if you've just said, I, I heard you tell me that you're not an alcoholic, but you've also told me about seven DWIs, or I see on your record that you have seven DWIs. There's a therapeutic value in just leaving that there. You've just left a discomfort in the room. So that, that's one way you can go with it. Another way you can go with it is to follow up. Can you tell me more about that? Like, tell me how that works. So where we get uh, another example, and you know, lots of hospital examples, but that's where we've been for a while. Um, there'll be people that say, I don't have a mental illness. I don't need to be in the hospital. But we indicate on the chart that they've been there eight times. So I said, it's kind of difficult for someone with, without a mental illness to end up in this hospital eight times. Can you tell me more about that? Can you tell me how you know, you've come into the hospital? Because again, one of the things I'm trying to do is see what stage of change they're in. 
the answer in that case was, well, the police in my town hate me. So whenever they see me out and around, they bring me down to the emergency room and they commit me and they send me back in this hospital. So I don't have a mental illness. It's just that the police hate me. So now what that's helped me do, because I asked about it and he gave me an answer, now I can identify, like you probably guess what stage of change this person's in, right? If they don't have a mental illness and it's because of the police, they have a cover story and that sounds a lot like someone in pre-contemplation. So you have a choice. The other one, and this is another really dated reference, I apologize, is anyone out there at all familiar with Columbo, the TV show? If not, no, watch me no, TV. No, I think no, it's still I around. You, you know my age. So, so it was this it, it was this detective, and he always played dumb. And he would go, Oh, you know what? There's just one thing I don't understand. And that was, of course, when he would ask the big question and break open the crime. So you can come at it in a Columbo method and say a lot of what's called Socratic questioning is very, very Columbo style. Where you'd say, Okay, there's just one thing I don't understand. You told me you don't have a mental illness. I hear you. So can you explain to me how you've ended up in 20 psychiatric hospitals if you don't have a mental illness? And again, I'm not being critical. I'm asking a question. I just want to hear it back because I'm gaining information. I don't want to give anything to that person yet. I'm listening. And I hope that I hope that answered it. So you can go in either direction. I'm fine with leaving the discomfort out there. And I'm also fine with following it up with a question, even if it's just tell me more about that. Can you give me some more about that? Because now you're sort of probing the pre-contemplation or denial. All right, reflections, we're gonna go in. The next, the next session, we're gonna do a little more practice around this. We're gonna dig into this a little deeper, uh, but for now, we'll just do the explanation part. So next up is the summary. And the way I make the analogy about the summary is basically, a summary is just basically a big blown up reflection, a little more involved. Um, and what it looks like is, I don't know if you've ever, if, if you've been in a restaurant and you've had a waiter or waitress, and you ever had that person that could take eight, pers eight people's orders and remember all of them and recite them back to you? First of all, that's an amazing skill I do not have, especially when you have people putting dressing on the side and substituting things and adding things. I always love that because one, if they got it wrong, you've got a chance to fix it before it gets in the kitchen. And two, if you change your mind about something, now's the time to do it. So this is the clinical version of that. So summarizing is when you just give somebody a summary of everything they've told you in that session as a means to do one of these three things. One is this collecting summary, which is just letting them know, just like a reflection, that you heard what they said. Because not only have you told them the whole story, you've given it back to them. Where I used to work in the emergency room, we would do a 45 minute assessment on someone. And then at the end, I would say, all right, you've told me a lot. I wanna make sure I get it straight. And I would give them the whole, I would give them the whole story back in a rundown. And one of two things would happen while I'm giving them this summary. Either, they would lean up on, onto their toes and lean in on something. And I know what that meant. That meant I got something wrong or there was something that they meant to tell me that they didn't tell me. And they're just waiting for me to get through the summary so that they can fix it at the end. So I already know they're leaning forward and it's like, okay, I, I, got, I got something. I don't have it perfect yet. The other reaction that they would get when I made the summary, when I finished the summary, they would sit back and take a breath. They would just go, that tells me that they know they were heard. I got it. Because now I got to go talk to my supervisor. I have to go talk to a psychiatrist. I have to... They are confident that I understand the story as they see it. Okay, good. That's a win. So that's a collecting summary. Another type of summary is the linking summary. And that's where you bring in things from maybe other sessions or from another time. Not only was I listening tonight, I've been listening all along. If you bring stuff in from the first time you met someone into a current session, that's very powerful. You know, I remember when you came in here and you were saying X, Y, and Z, and that reminds me of what you're dealing with now. That's grounding for them. And again, you're listening, it shows you're listening. The next one, if you work with people that it's very hard to break into when they're on a roll, it helps you transition. So to me, this allows me to take a time out and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm hearing a lot of stuff and I don't want to miss any of it. 
I want to keep all this. So let me tell you what I got so far. Tell me if I got it right. And then here's the example of that. And then you can use that to transition. So if this person has gotten a little tangential and they're way off the path now, you can say, all right, well, hang on a second. You're, you're throwing a lot of stuff at me and I want to make sure I got it. So here's what I got. You give it to them and say, and then follow it with a question. This is kind of like in group when you kind of feed it back in again. So here's what I hear you telling me. Oh, and I have a question. And then you move it that way. There is um, so, uh, one question here, and I'm guessing that perhaps maybe this will be a good place to maybe yeah. stop and take any additional questions. Um, so mm -hmm. we have, because we only have 10 minutes left. Um, right. One question is, what do you do when a client gives a rambling, unrealistic answer? A rambling, unrealistic answer. So and I, I'm, I'm guessing that that is from, you, you know, additional questioning or prodding that um, the therapist or, or um, provider may be, um, you know, engaging in with them. Yeah, so that's one of the uses that that's one of the uses of this transitional summary. Uh, you get this. Sorry, and just to clarify, it was directly in reference to double-sided reflections. Oh, to double-sided reflection. Oh, okay. So it's really well. I would almost need a specific example of that. I know that might be a bit of typing to do, or actually, can I, you, I can think you that the part? I think that the gist of it is, you know, when you are highlighting discrepancies between what the person is saying and what you are seeing perhaps. Mm -hmm. And the person tries to explain in a way that is kind of like spinning their wheels or nonsensical. Sure. And I'm getting a yes from the person who asked the question. So I'm glad I'm asking it to, <laughs> to Ken appropriately. Well, that's, that's, no, that's good. That's, that's really good. Because one of, the, one of the, the theoretical underpinnings of motivational interviewing is developing discrepancy. So you, you want them to have that struggle because you hear them talking around the problem. Again, I, I'll say this, I, I, one of my jokes about working with people that are new to addictions recovery is they can't answer a yes or no question anyway. There's yes, there's no, and there's, well, you see, it was like this. And as soon as you hear that, you may as well buckle your seatbelt because you're about to go for a big ride. Um, so you just wanna leave the discrepancy out there because the discrepancy is gonna help you. So if this person gives this rambling nonsensical answer, that's all good stuff. That's all stuff that you're going to use later because it doesn't add up. You know, uh, if from last session, I talked about the person who felt that they were a member of the English royal family despite having the Bronx accent. So that was something that we were going to come back to. You know, we've lived in, wait a minute, you've lived in New Jersey and New York your entire life. How are you a member of the English royal family? We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that down the road. But in the meantime, we're just pointing out the discrepancies in the story. We're going to get to all that stuff later, but we're just keeping that out there. The other thing I thought of in re response to your question is this, is the transitioning. Um, another critical piece about a summary is what you choose to highlight and what you choose to ignore. And the, the next section that we're, we're going to get into, we'll, we'll probably do some exercises around uh, ORs before we move into this. But when we do change and sustain talk, one of the major tasks for you as the facilitator is what do I pay attention to and what do I let go? And I tend to silently, you know, kind of like your group facilitation skills, you, you focus on the stuff that's pertinent and has to do with the group and you sort of let the extraneous stuff go. What you pay attention to is very significant motivational interviewing. So I would let the, you know, the rambling and the, you know, I would just let all that stuff go. And I would try to find the piece of what they said that I could zoom in on and emphasize that. That's really one of the art forms of motivational interviewing is, uh, to quote a, a famous uh, singer, knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep, that kind of thing. So that's what I would kind of do with that. Find the parts of it that you can work with and let the rest go. And you emphasize the focus on um, the change talk and not so much on the sustain talk. And we'll talk a, a lot about more about that one in the next session. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at this moment. Oh, I, let me see. Nope. Oh, just uh, a couple of comments. So um, that's a good place to break change. And yeah. Yeah. So I would welcome folks. If you have any other questions, 
Uh, we have about five minutes, six minutes. Um, so if you have any other questions, please feel free to either type it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, Angela, I see your hand is raised. I'm not sure if you want the mic or if it's an accidental hand raise. Or if you should, maybe you're just waving. <laughs> oh, Angela's hand went down right away. She's like, I am not waving at you. <laughs> we, we call that the Zoom equivalent of a butt dial, right? Yeah, somebody actually did tell me that they they butt waved me earlier. So that's fine. It <laughs> happens. So I, I apologize in this session, we do a whole lot more talking. Uh, when we get into the next session, we're going to do some more of this practice stuff. I'm going to send you guys some worksheets so that you can so, actually look at this stuff and we'll actually get to practice it a little bit in addition to going through the rest of the material. There, I, I think, all right. So Shannon, I hope I'm finding your question. It says, as care coordinators, we're asked to provide resources to members. Kind of goes against not giving ideas or suggestions. Example, I want spinal relief but the doctor won't do spinal surgery on me because my spine is straight from a member with Munchausen syndrome. Oh boy. Um, so I'm, what was the question? I'm sorry. I might be giving resources. Uh, you know, you're not being judgmental, but you're giving resources. I'm not sure what the question giving the resources and yet nothing is still good because they have Munchausen syndrome. Right, 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 right. Oh, one of the most difficult type of situations to work with. I've only seen a few of them. Really, really, really difficult. Uh, the, the idea of giving resources is more appropriate in some stages than others. If you have someone that's in pre-contemplation, I mean, you can offer it and they're going to tell you no. If it's somebody that's in contemplation, that's when you're actively in giving information because you're trying to make that argument for and against change. If someone's in preparation, you're giving information to help with the plan um, and in action you can. So you, you actually can give the resources, but you're giving that person the autonomy, just like with advice, to not take it. You ask them if they're open to it or receptive to it. If they're not, they're not. Uh, because, I mean, you know, the situation with uh, with Munchausen's, you know, whatever that person has going on emotionally, they've diverted it into these, you know, into generating um, physical symptoms. So I, I, as a as a care coordinator, I guess I don't know enough about what your medical responsibilities versus what your psychological responsibilities are. I would be turfing in my role. I turf a lot of that medical stuff where you need to talk to your doctor about this. Let's work about on some of this other stuff, you know? And again, part of motivational interviewing is sitting in that discrepancy. I hear you that you feel like the surgery is going to help you and help be the answer to all of your symptoms, but apparently your doctor feels a different way. And then you just leave that discrepancy out there. You know, what you don't want to do is be in the position where you have to answer for the doctor. That's a position, you know, nobody wants to be in between the doctor and the patient. And that actually sounds like a role that you might get stuck in. Thank you, Ken. And I want to acknowledge that anybody who is a care coordinator, a case manager, a case coordinator, whatever it is called, I've done it as well. And it's an incredibly difficult job to be in that position of kind of between the individual that we're serving and the doctor or the nursing staff, the psych psychiatric staff, right? In trying to be that advocate almost on both sides in some cases. So I really just want to acknowledge that tough work. Um, so we have two minutes left. We're going to go ahead and start winding down now, Ken. Um, mm -hmm. I you have the end slide you can go to that I have to read. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'm going to skip through a few, but I'll get sorry. There. I'm very sorry, but Washington makes me read this. No harm. No harm. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time, attention, and participation. Today's webinar was hosted by DBHR through the Healthcare Authority. We'd like to remind you that the slides, a link to the recording of this session, and a wealth of other resources will be made available in the follow-up email, which will come from the state of Washington. Don't forget to check out our Foundational Community Supports newsletter for all things FCS and upcoming training events. And additionally, if you're interested in becoming an FCS provider, you can reach out to Amerigroup on the, at the number 
listed on the screen. And that's our little um, advertisement for the state of Washington's foundational community support. So we thank you all for attending. Um, hope to see all of you, if not most of you next week and take care. Happy holidays. <laughs>